This is part 3 of the Spiral Inductor video. We'll introduce you to the new ANSYS Electronics desktop interface and show you how to set up a simulation using the high performance computing or HPC capabilities in the software. We'll also show how to view the analysis results for inductance and quality factor. This is the ANSYS Electronics desktop. It provides you with a unified user interface where you can create both electromagnetic designs and circuits. As you can see, if we go to the project menu, we can access all of the Field Solver products. We have HFSS in the classic 3D CAD interface, HFSS in a layout interface, uh, the HFIE solver, Q3D, and 2D extractor. We can insert any combination of these design types into a single project file. You can also create ANSYS Designer circuit schematics, or netlists, in the same project, too. And then you can use those schematics to wire up the different field solver models and create a model of a higher level system. So this is a great way to manage a complicated design that requires several different analysis tools to model all of its pieces. Now let's open up the layout of our spiral inductor model in the electronics desktop. We expect this to be a computationally demanding analysis, so we're going to set up an HPC solution. We go to the Tools menu and select the HPC and Analysis Options item. From that dialog, we can define custom HPC configurations for different applications. We can give our new configuration a name. This one will be specifically for spiral inductor simulations. Then we can add the names of the compute servers that we want to use. There could be several of these, but for this example we'll just use one. We can tell the software how many different tasks or HFSS solver processes we want each server to run. These tasks can be solving at different frequencies in a frequency sweep, or different combinations of design variables in a parameter sweep. We can also tell it how many CPU cores should be used for each process. With this setup, we'll allow the server to run four simultaneous tasks each with eight cores for 32 cores total. Once we have our setup defined, then we can make this configuration active. At this point, we're ready to launch the HPC solution. We could wait for it to complete and then do some post-processing. But we have the flexibility to define the post-processing reports that we want to see now, before the simulation has started, and then we can let the solver populate them as it runs. We could even create these reports while the solver is running. So let's create a report now. We'll choose the two output variables that we defined for the effective inductance, L, and the quality factor, Q, and put them in a single rectangular plot. Then we invoke the solver. We had set up an HPC analysis earlier, so we see different progress bars for each task that's currently running. These tasks are solving at different frequency points in the sweep we defined. You can also see the report that we created earlier. It's showing a snapshot of the frequency sweep solution based on the frequency points that we have solved for so far. As more points are solved, the plot will be updated dynamically with the new data. After the solution completes, we get the final plot shown here. L starts near DC at about 20 nanohenries, and then it slowly climbs as the frequency goes up. But then when we get to 1 GHz, it starts to take off until we hit about 2 GHz, where the inductance suddenly goes negative. This happens because the spiral inductor isn't just a pure inductance. It has a series inductance with an impedance J omega L, but it also has some shunt capacitance to the substrate with an impedance of 1 over J omega C. When the frequency goes up, the inductor's impedance also goes up, but the shunt capacitor's impedance goes down. At some point, the capacitor's impedance goes below the inductor's and effectively shorts it out. When this happens, the sign of the imaginary part of their combined impedances will flip from positive to negative. This behavior can be predicted qualitatively from simple circuit theory, but of course to get the precise values you need to use the field solver. The bottom line is that the spiral definitely won't work as an inductor beyond 2 GHz. Remember that we defined Q as the ratio of the imaginary part of the impedance to the real. You can see that it hits zero at about the same resonance frequency as the inductance because the imaginary parts of the capacitor and inductor impedances have cancelled one another out. Another interesting feature is that the quality factor peaks at about 0.7 GHz. This would be the optimum frequency to operate the spiral inductor because here its inductive component is at its highest ratio over its resistive component by a factor of about 6 to 1. This concludes our video series on modeling spiral inductors in ANSYS Designer and the new ANSYS Electronics desktop.